I'm Sam Rodriguez. This is Daring Faith. I'm the wingman of the one and only Ken Harrison, CEO and president of Promise Keepers, an amazing kingdom leader with a legitimate prophetic voice, prophetic, not pathetic, for such a time as this, <laughs> LAPD's finest. I'm playing right now, carry on wayward son from Kansas back in the late 70s as I'm introducing Ken Harrison. Ken, here we are for such a time as this with a mutual friend. Who do we have? One of our closest friends, Pastor Steve Berger, uh, founded and built one of the best churches in all of Nashville, Grace Chapel in Franklin, Tennessee, has a lot of majorly influential people who go to his church when he just retired. Steve, he's preached one of the greatest messages that I've ever heard, and it's on repentance. Steve has a lot of unique insights that he has. Um, he's sitting in D.C. right now where he has major influence with a lot of our political leaders. And Steve, I have a question for you. It's an easy question. Um, so you could probably knock this out in two minutes, but why do good things happen to bad people? I mean, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm sorry. And by the way, the other <laughs> way around, there's a lot of good things happening to bad uh, people. A little dyslexia of the mouth there. No, but it's, it's a legit. <laughs> I like this. Let's juxtapose both ideas there, Steve. That was going to be so dramatic. But it I worked. totally screwed it up. It worked. And, and I love, Ken, how you said that this is an easy question. This is, <laughs> this is the question of the ages. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's, I'm glad you think it's easy to answer. Um, before I even attempt to tackle that, I, I do want to say this. If we're going to be talking about suffering, which we are, and we're going to be mm -hmm. talking about pain, every listener needs to understand that these are just not shallow, pat, kind of Christianese answers. These are answers that have to be rooted in the character of God, the word of God, and the ways of God. And so I'm not saying any of these things just flippantly at all. I'm talking about things that that I and many others like me have lived and suffered with. And so uh, it comes with a great deal of experience. Why do bad things happen to good people? The shortest answer is why not? We live in a broken world, a fallen world, and every single one of us are, subs are susceptible to any kind of um, brokenness, any kind of sorrow, any kind of suffering. We look at what Jesus said, um, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and the storms beat on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Uh, Christians who have come to have some kind of belief that they aren't going to suffer if they just have enough faith, um, I feel sorry for them because when something tragic knocks on their door, their faith oftentimes crumbles, and it really is a sad thing to witness. Just justify that, and I, you referenced the fact there are Christians that have maybe an unbridled, maybe an unhealthy, and I'm paraphrasing your description, level of faith where they assume you embrace Christ you're protected from the from the storms and the ills of this world. Uh, help me understand that in the context of Luke 10, 19. I have given you power over all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. Uh, God is faithful to protect you from all harm and all evil. 1 John 5, 18. God's children do not make it a habit of sinning. God protects his children. Therefore, nothing will ever harm them. Psalm 91, verse 4. God's faithful promises are your armor and your protection. All right, Steve. So we have biblical passages that tell me that if I'm a follower of Jesus, somehow I have this insurance policy, and then you're telling me, well, wait a moment, sunshine. Go ahead. What say ye? Yeah, that's easy. So you quoted Jesus, you co quoted John the Beloved, and you quoted Paul. Paul had his head cut off. John was boiled in oil, died an old man, and Jesus suffered unimaginably, and and it wasn't just the crucifixion for the sins of mankind. He suffered um, um, emotional stress and, and all of that. So to try to take what these men have said and pigeonhole it and nail it down in a very narrow way to you'll never be harmed, meaning you'll never have a bad day and nothing bad will ever happen to you, uh, is, is not even what happened in their own lives. It clearly doesn't mean that. Ultimately, what we're talking about here, because this is what this is what God wants, Sam and Ken, you, what God is looking to preserve in all of us is our faith. That's that's it. 
our faith, our trust in him. That is the ultimate thing. And so in the midst of bad things happening, in the midst of us having power over the enemy, sure, we're going to suffer, but we don't have to suffer to the point where our faith gets lost. We're kept by the very power of God for that much more than being kept from anything bad ever happening. Does that negate the fact that God has, and of course he does, but does that negate the fact that on occasions, even today in our current reality, we've heard, we all have testimonies when you were uh, serving in the LAPD, but in other circumstances of God supernaturally intervening and protecting? Does that negate the fact that God still shows up? It, it doesn't negate the fact at all, but it's it, what does God show up to do? Does God show up to keep us from any kind of trial or tribulation? Or does God keep uh, show up to keep us and preserve our faith from falling? And so I've come to understand by balancing the totality of Scripture and not just picking and cherry picking one thing here and one thing there. God shows up big time. This creates this holy tension, Sam, between the promises Agreed. of God and the sovereignty Agreed. of God. Agreed. And and so when we look at both of them and unpack both of them, we realize we've got a God who gives promises, man, we need to trust and believe and have faith. But at the end of the day, if the promise doesn't look the way we wanted it to or hope that it would, we still have to trust God with the end result. Ken, you and Steve, why is there in the Western world and in Western Christianity an uber saturation of a false gospel narrative? I, I concur with Steve and everything you stated. But, but why do we embrace the idea, th this, this false notion of if you're a Christian, somehow it's happy, happy, happy. It's the Lego movie, you know? Uh, you know, everything is, everything is awesome. And it's just this awesome, 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 happy, happy. And then life hits you right in the face, man. I mean, what in the world, why, why do, why, what is our inclination to embrace this Pollyanna-ish version of Christianity that negates suffering. Have we lost in the evangelical world, in the Protestant world, the idea of suffering? Catholics have not. Catholics uber elevate, maybe to the umpteenth degree where they make an idol out of suffering. And that's arguable in the Roman Catholic faith. But Protestants have gone to the other extreme of negating any and all suffering any and all processes that are that are difficult talk to me why what are we embracing what kind of gospel are we preaching man well hebrews says that jesus learns obedience through his father through suffering jesus had to suffer to learn obedience that that's a crazy verse that i'd love for you to take on steve so i'll give you 60 seconds to think that through <laughs> but all growth comes from pain all growth comes from pain if I want to learn Spanish, which I've been saying I do for 30 years. But you know the curse words, which I could commend you for that. And, and I also know how to say monosariva, you know. So. I don't know what that means, but my mom-in-law would probably repeat that <laughs> many times. Go ahead. That means hands up, by the oh, way. Oh, sorry. did not know that. Yes, gotcha. a, Mr. Fluent in Spanish and apparently German. Rosetta Stone. <laughs> um, but, you know, if I want to get in shape, I got to start eating healthy. I got to work out. It's, it's, all growth comes from pain. And so, as Steve was saying, what is the point of our life? Ephesians 2.10, the point of our life is we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yes. So God is going to do what it takes to bring us to more full joy and to the most complete judgment we can have in heaven. And that takes pain to get us to grow. You're, you're preaching a gospel totally counterintuitive to what we're hearing in mass gospel dissemination. You're, you're, you just elevated this idea that suffering and pain are part of our Christian experience. That's exactly right. Steve, is that accurate? It is accurate. And in fact, it's spot on accurate. Uh, Sam, to go back to what you were saying to, to show here, um, when Paul writes in Philippians in chapter one, um, or excuse me, chapter three, when he says that he wants to know the fellowship of Christ's suffering, and then what does he say? And then I want to know the power of, of the resurrection. resurrection. <laughs> See, all we want to do, we want the power. I want the glory. I want resurrection. But not the suffering. No, 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 no. It doesn't happen. Suffering comes first before resurrection. And so if we're going to be realistic followers of Jesus, you need to know that suffering is part of the program, period. And if you think it's not, you're going to be sorely disappointed again when it knocks on your door. Let, let me say something else to you guys about suffering and that, that's really important. Jesus is on the cross, 
And in his darkest hour, he says, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? Friends, we love to tell people, my wife and I, Sarah, she just wrote an incredible book on suffering and grief and all of that, uh, Hope in the 11th Hour. Sarah and I love to minister to parents who have had children go to heaven like we have, and, and we tell them this, it's okay to ask God why. Jesus did. Mm -hmm. But that was the second to last thing, Sam and Ken, that Jesus said, was the second to last thing. My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? But then the last thing that he said, and this is where you have to move, is he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Mm. Okay? So this is the transition that has to be made. It's okay to ask why you just can't stay there forever because you're never going to get a satisfactory answer this side of heaven. You have to move into, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, I even feel forsaken. But here's what I'm doing. I'm putting my very spirit into your hands. It is the ultimate declaration of trust in the living God. I'm trusting you, though I don't understand what's happening. People who are suffering have to get there. Beautiful, brilliant. Mm -hmm. To both Ken and Steve, and feel free at your discretion to disclose what you feel comfortable with. Any moment in your life where you had a suffering moment that prompted you to execute and exercise what Steve just laid out, where you, for a moment, you asked why, but then subsequently, be it however long it took, you were prompted to say, you know what, I just give it all to you. Don't, don't understand. Faith is not understanding. You're not, you're not ever called to understand God. Faith is trusting God when life makes no sense. It's trust even when you don't understand. Have you ever had that moment? Um, not since last week. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, last week, uh, a, a dear friend, um, her, her son was killed. Um, this was 10 years after her husband was killed. And <sighs> called her up. She lives in a different city. And with her crying hysterically, just bawling on the phone, why, 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 she asked me. And you know what she didn't need to hear? She didn't need to hear, well, you know, all things work together for good for those who love God and call according to his purpose. She didn't need to hear any platitudes. She just needed me to listen and cry with her. Wow. You know, so I, I, you know, I said earlier, we grow through pain. And someone says, well, how, explain to me how I grew through my husband and my son being dead. How, how did I grow? If I, I'd rather not grow. I'd rather just die and be with them. Um, that's my experience, Steve. Uh, I know you've had some. Yeah, there's, there's so much to this topic. Um, you know, uh, we're 13 and a half years into our journey with our 18-year-old son leaving the house and within 20 minutes was in a fatal car accident three days before his 19th birthday. Um, we literally, on his 19th birthday, released him to heaven. We fulfilled his desire to be an organ donor. Five lives were saved immediately. 77 lives were impacted by his, his gift. Um, yeah, Sam, you definitely ask why. Uh, I'm a pastor of a very large local church at the time. It's on Nashville News. It's in the newspapers. Uh, it's widespread. And so, yeah, you definitely ask why. But um, there's, there's something to this, okay? Back, back to Ken, what you were saying about growth really quick. Job and all of his suffering, at the end, the conclusion of the matter, he said, Lord, I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Mm. The point is this, until there is some degree of, of suffering in our lives, our understanding of the mystery of the nearness, the closeness of God really isn't everything that it can be. You can hear of God, but at the end of suffering and suffering faithfully without losing your faith, you get to the point where you actually see God. You have revelation, understanding of God that you would never have had apart from suffering. And so ask why, hang in there by the grace of God and grow in Christ. The clarity of your own experience and what it speaks to, not just men, but everyone who's interacting with this podcast, you hear you hear, and on occasion, on many occasions, I would argue from Genesis to Revelation, there's a meta-narrative of Revelation 
that every single egregious, difficult circumstance, moment, season, chapter enables you to see. To see an attribute, to see the nature and the true character of a loving God whose sovereign plan for your life will be fulfilled and you will shine with his glory and for his glory at the end of the day. The preservation of faith is what moved me from what Steve shared. At the end of the day, it's about preserving your faith. Jude one twenty four. he who can keep you, who is able to, is the Greek exeget, to keep you from falling. Another version reads failing. That's your faith. That's your faith. So this obsession with being happy, and I'm not, I mean, I get there, John chapter one, verse two, and John 15, 11. He wants your joy to be filled. He does. But if we make happiness the idol, the catch-all of our Christian experience, we're going to miss it. We miss we mistake words. So happiness and joy are different things. Yeah. I'm happy when I have a good meal. Joy is a state of being. That's spiritual. And, and if we're happy all the time, we will not have joy. Yeah. Thinking about some other scriptures, um, what is what is Paul? What does God say to Ananias after Paul's met Christ on the on the road to Damascus? And he says to Ananias, "Hey, there's a guy coming to you. I must show him how much he must suffer for my name." We think, well, I'd like to be Paul. I don't want to be Paul. I mean, you think about cold and and shipwrecked and stoned and tortured and whipped and I mean, on and on and singing the whole time. Do I have what it takes to be that way? No. Why? Why don't I? Because I haven't suffered like Paul has. God, I want everything God has to offer, but boy, when I look at the price to be paid, I think I kind of do, but, you know, Moses walking around the desert for 40 years with a bunch of people whining at him. Yep. On and on and on, we look at the, the great saints. With the same bread from Panera every single day. I mean, put that in perspective, <laughs> every day. So we see that that what it, it, it's pain that grows our faith, and faith is incredibly valuable to the Lord, it says in First Peter. This podcast is is really it's a, it's antithetical to the current you know super be happy go get them, I mean we we have a go get them faith we do, but it's in the midst of suffering. Final note, my we have a little mezzanine little balcony in one of our guest bedrooms at home, and I shared this on Sunday at our church, and we just went through a moment right storm came in California it's been raining the drought is over hey there it is, uh, but one of the outcomes although is, you people are too dumb to capture your water well because we can just yeah. we, because we little tadpole <laughs> fishes are more important than human beings different story for another day, so we have this issue we walk in my son in law walks in Christian who's playing right now for the stallions he walks into the guest room and says hey pop uh, your sheetrock look I walked in do the sheetrock completely down oh. water coming down like a flood. I'm going, what just happened? So there was an issue with the balcony above that room. Uh, you know, just the drainage was done wrong and blah, 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 when it was originally built. Back to the story. Roto-Rooter comes in, triage, emergency services in respect to restoring. Guy looks at me and says like, not your first rodeo. I go, whoa, I bought the house four years ago. It is my first rodeo with this. He goes, no, no, this has happened multiple occasions. Let me show you the mole and the mildew that accumulated here throughout the years. This is not the first time, not the first oh, damage. Man. It's been here for years. Whoever was sleeping in this guest room, you should thank God this took place because it is that egregious. Oh. They had to address everything from years of accumulation. Sometimes it's the storms and the most difficult moments that truly reveal. They, don't, they may not define this, but they reveal who we really are. Mm. And they enable... God or provide space for God to address issues that otherwise we would not be able to address. Revelation comes via the conduit of pain and suffering and storms. Storms reveal. And so we're, wow, you want to hear really what a mature Christian can look like? The audacity to be thankful for the storms. Mm. Can you, is that like pseudo masochist? God, thank you for the hell I went through because I discovered that even though I didn't see him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm fully cognizant of the fact that the fourth man was in the fire, that he was there. So there it is for such a time as this. Final words. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what? And the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What say you, Steve? Yeah, my closing thought would be never underestimate the power of pain as members of the body of Christ, there are times when people who have been so ravaged by pain 
they can't find their way to Jesus. And as members of the body of Christ, we need to be the stretcher bearers. We need to be inconvenienced. We need to lift them up on the roof. We need to remove the shingles and drop them down at the feet of Jesus because they can't get there by themselves. Body of Christ, don't underestimate the power of pain in hurting people. Do your part. Don't judge them. Don't mock their faith. Bring them to the feet of Jesus where they can be healed. They can't get there by themselves. Drop the mic. Yeah. Daring faith. Let's do one thing together. Let's go change the world. Thank you.